to record this one. All right. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, everything's all set. Uh, schedule for next week is that lab exam schedule. So everybody's in person again, 50 minutes, and then coordinate who is going to be going where. Um, that will probably avert what, what happened today where too many people are on Zoom right now. So, and again, like if you're sick, obviously stay home. Um, but again, you're paying for the time to be in person and somebody else would likely want to be in person in that case. So let me know and we can coordinate that next time. Um, as far as what we're doing today, this is going to be very related to what we did with the turtle heart. We're going to see times that, you know, the thing, everything's going to kind of cross over. At the other end of it, though, this is where we get more into the human disease side. And this is going to be essentially where, if, even if you're an exercise fit person, PCOT, and obviously in healthcare, this is going to be very important because, as you, can, as you probably know, heart disease is the biggest cause of mortality in this country, at least. And if you encounter patients or clients, oftentimes you're going to have to account for how their cardiac, you know, kind of health is in that case. So, as far as the lab overview, what we're going to do today is mimic the main healthcare way of tracking your ECG, and that's called Eindhoven's triangle. You'll get the instructions on where to hook up the electrodes. But essentially, what this is doing is going to give you three different signals of your heart's action potential. And that big PQRS wave, and T as well. And this is going to allow us to track if we're going to have electrodes over here, here, and then I think one on the leg as well. This is the basic shape that we're looking to look for today. P Q R S T. Okay. We'll take a look at that normal section right here. This is how we measure it. The reason we have three signals is kind of the same reason that you hear the word, you know, like in the movies and the shows, triangulate the signal. Coming from three different directions allows you to see exactly where the signal is coming from and have the most accurate measure. That's why a single electrode will give you a P, Q, R, S, T, but it may not be the whole picture. It may not be the most accurate picture. That's why we can use three electrodes to find everything and go from there. Okay. So. Let's take a look at the heart. Let's break down how this signal kind of comes from, what direction it's coming from, and why that's important because, as we'll see, we're going to run through this pretty quick. I know you've seen this in lecture too, so it will be a little quicker than, than normal. Um, but we want to see how things work when they're normal so that you can always tell very quickly when things are not normal in that case. So, first signal starts at the SA node. This is the origin of your pace of your heart. We're just going to do this as a one, two, three, four. The SA node is full of those funny sodium channels. Goofy little name. Don't don't let it you know frustrate you. These are just very simple. These are very specific sodium channels. And remember, they only open when this PQRS right here finishes. This T wave is what triggers the P wave, okay? And the P wave is right here. Okay, you can match that up a little bit. Maybe I should draw these in blue. There we go. Okay, that's the beginning of your pace. It's going to excite both of these atria and A right here. Remember, atria are small. They're the ones that first receive and in this case produce the signal. Your first area of transit where this signal and this action potential is going to travel is through the AV node. That's number two. The AV node is essentially the transition between the atria and the ventricle. As this burst, this action potential is coming through, this key right here, this is kind of what you would call kind of a choke point right here. It's the only usual area that it's allowed through. This is kind of the coordinated mechanism of the heart. And the reason and the importance of the AV node is not actually to make one of these waves. The importance of the AV node is to 
cause this delay right here. You want that delay so that your rhythm stays flexible, so that it stays regular. This delay allows you to move up or down this, this QRS wave if you need a heart rate that's faster or slower. You can control that with those neurotransmitters, hormones that we talked about. But this delay right here between P and QRS is what allows us to have that flexibility. And that's the role of the AV node in this case. You can call that a delay. You can call that delay. Call that flexible delay if you want. Okay. Then normally we move on to the third checkpoint. Bundle of TIF. As the action potential is going through now, and remember the whole heart is connected by these gap junctions, so every cell is sharing that burst of electricity, quote unquote. As it travels through bundle to hip, what I'm drawing here is the action potential innervating and traveling through the ventricle. And this is super important because they're doing all the pumping, about 80%. And these, in the bundle of hip, when these are traveling through right here, these action potentials, this is your QRS. This is your big burst. And everybody in Zoom, if something's wrong, just light up the chat and I'll, um, I'll try and address it quick. So this normal, normal journey has four parts. The fourth and final part, and keep this in mind the most, are these Purkinje fibers. Right here, there's a transition where the action potential is kind of finished innervating the ventricle. And as you can tell here in the arrow, it's going to kind of travel back up. And that is going to correspond to our T wave right here. So what these Purkinje fibers do is send that final T wave, that repolarization, back up throughout the heart, back to the atria. And what these waves and this small final P wave signal is going to do is trigger another P wave. And that's the primary role of the P wave is to reset the SA node, show it that the beat has finished and it's ready for another one. The whole role of these funny sodium channels is to wait this little, T, this little T wave right here to excite them, then they pump in the sodium, action potential starts all over again. T wave hit. Okay. So that's how we're looking when things are normal. This is kind of the strict mechanism, how the rhythm is supposed to flow. Everything's fine for you. But in healthcare and in anything else, you have to look for where things are not fine. So we can flip over. So yeah, I'm gonna be going through it like this. So if you want to draw in your notebook like that, that's helpful. Or if you just want to take general notes, that's good too. And again, if you're not a note person, that's okay too. All right. This is where we left off. Here's our normal ECG right here. This is what we're gonna see from all of you today, hopefully. And go from there. We have P, Q, R, S, C. If you can fill all these out right here, you see the P is already filled in for you right there. So that pattern is what you're really going to be mainly looking for. And you can characterize this, remember, as your normal pattern. Okay. Let's start with something a little spontaneous and not classified technically as its own disease. But what if there was a source other than the SA node telling the heart to beat? We did this when we poked the turtle heart. That mechanical force mimics the pacing force of the SA node in a very rough shot bad way. So right now, this isn't a condition on its own. It can cause some of the other conditions, and we'll see. If for any reason you have a source of cells in your heart that send an action potential or send a stimulus for some reason or receive it, whatever, and it comes from the wrong direction, as you can see right here, it's in the wrong atria, 
going to spread here, it could spread down, it could do all kinds of bad stuff. Characteristically, when you see an ectopic source, the P wave is inverted. That inversion is because your Eintobus triangle is reading it from it coming from the wrong direction. See how this is kind of heading this way. This one is heading more this way. So you're still going to read that signal in the atria over here as a quote unquote P wave. But it will be inverted. It's not going to make as much sense. That's why it's there. So, ectopic sources. Um, this got brought up last class. It was a really good question. What are sources of this? And there's a lot. Tons of them are lifestyle oriented. Okay. If you have weak stimulants, like tobacco, all the time, stuff like that, you send in a lot of nicotine. Nicotine excites your heart a little bit. Gets a little burst once in a while. Oops, there's an extra beat. And we'll see what happens with extra beat. All right. Acute stimulants. So, Let's say cigarettes are something like chronic stimulants for your heart. Acute stimulants is something like cocaine. So if any of you at a work in healthcare, you'll see OD patients, some of them are on cocaine. One of the problems there is that they get a big burst of a stimulating drug, big sources of ectopic stimuli show up, hit the heart to keep going faster and faster. Regulation starts breaking down. Another good source is specific foods. Too much sugar sometimes can lead to the energy kind of mechanisms in your heart cells to think that they're being stimulated when they're not. They're burning too much energy or they're received too much signal energy from that. And the last fun one, breath. Your body sends neurotransmitters, stress hormones chronically or acutely and sometimes bathe the heart in this signal so much that the SA node is kind of overwhelmed and a new source can burst in the heart. Now remember, these little ectopic sources, when they're small and controlled, it's not a big deal. A lot of us in this room, me specifically because I'm getting older and that stuff, we can have kind of skip beats, small heart murmurs, things like that. Sometimes the heartbeat isn't always going to be perfect in that case. And it's reasons like this and lifestyle that you can control the number of these ectopic sources that you have. Because the number of risks that these pose that kind of start getting us into these diseases. All right, so let's take a little bit, take a little closer look here. I just wanted to highlight some of these good images right here that Penny has for you. They're really clear, I think. So again, in your normal QRS complex, remember how this has a massive this action potential right here? This has a huge refractory period. Actually, I don't know if we'll Yeah, huge RP. Remember how this action potential is kind of extending the whole way. It's really nice and like drawn out and no other action potential can happen during this time. That's what controls your heart to just be regular. We saw this in the turtle a little bit. So we saw an ectopic source in the atria that causes the P wave to be inverted. Similarly, if we have an ectopic source here in the ventricle, we have an inverted QRS. You still have your typical P wave, but you have no P wave as well. So again, you're not going to see these being diagnosed as a life-threatening thing, but these can lead to irregularities in the heart that can lead to one of the, some of the bad stuff down the line that we're going to see. This also, this last image right here, is probably one of your best ones to just kind of summarize um, what is happening with the contractions alongside the action potential. So if here's your P wave right here, here's the AP in the atria. See how it's kind of smaller right here running along. And if here's your QRS, at the end of that QRS spike is right when that action potential hits. This is the AP in the ventricle. Remember, the, the ventricles are where you have that huge amount of power. They're the, they're the thing doing everything at this case. And the T wave comes when the action potential is finished, thus signaling to it again. So, although this isn't disease related, this is actually a pretty good image in your book to take a look at if it's not, if things aren't making sense, how these are coordinating, this is a good place to start looking. All right, time for disease.
So before we get into AV node blocks, remember where the AV node is. This structure is the transit between the atria and the ventricle. If you have damage in it for any reason, that signal may not translate 100%. So for first degree atrial or for first degree AV issues, you're basically at like 80% capacity, call it that. About 80% of that actual potential is getting through. But the good thing about a first degree AV node block is that you're not going to really see anything physiologically bad. That's good. It can be a sign of things to come. Essentially, what it's telling you is that if this is your AV node right here, you've got maybe some, some damage or some clots or some crap of other some kind that is interfering with flow of these ion signals that are coming at the AP. So if you've got blockage here, but ultimately you can get through, that's a first degree AV node block. What you'll see in that case is because there's a delay in the signal, because you can't get the full action potential through in time, the delay that's usually responsible from the AP is a little longer. It takes a little more time to flood those signals Like I said, it's not life threatening because you're still pumping your ventricles, everything's fine. But this is something medically that would be needed, you would need to address. Not necessarily by treatment yet, but maybe a couple of lifestyle changes to make sure that like some of the some of the blockages are done. Kind of gotten out of. Okay. Let's turn things up a notch to a second degree A B block. So a first degree was something like, okay, like 20% block. Let's call this like half block. Okay, just to visualize it. Those aren't real numbers, but it helps. This means that sometimes your P wave is going to make it. Everything's fine. You have a nice QRS. We're good. But every so often, the AV node is so blocked, you skip a beat. Skip beats are the signs, the first sign of a second degree AV node block. Some of them are not getting through. Blockage in the node is severe enough, the damage to those cells is severe enough. You can actually visualize this damage here. Now we're starting to get into damage to the heart. Again, not directly life threatening, but remember what we saw when you have skipped beats, vents are filling with blood in excess. So to pump out that excess blood, they have to have a harder hit. Remember, remember how the turtle heart had to basically really pump out all the blood of that heart. You have a second degree AV node block. You're going to have a lot of heavy ventricles waiting to pump, you know, maybe 20 times a day even. That's not good. So every time that you have to have a massive heartbeat to pump these out, you're going to do a little bit, little bit of damage in that case, maybe, or at least you kind of run that risk. So this is where maybe intervention starts coming in. Elderly patients of yours, though, this starts, you start to get into chronic territory in this case where you're not going to actually treat someone for this. You just have to monitor it. Okay. But if you're having this issue, not only can this lead to that overstretching and that massive heartbeat, we'll see this later. When you leave blood around too long in the same spot, it's going to clot. Clotted blood clogs stuff. So if you have too many skip beats in a row, all of a sudden there's blood that's been sitting in the ventricle, it's just pooling up and it hasn't been pumped anywhere. The clotting factors start coming out. That's what happens when blood is not flowing, moving, helping. All right, last one. We are at 20% block and 50% block. 100% block. How is this possible? Okay. You have you have a P node or a P wave. 
You have some QRSs still showing up. How? None of the signal that you're transmitting, or that you're trying to transmission, oh, sorry, none of the signal in third degree that you're transmitting through the AV node is making it. How is that possible that the ventricle can still be in this case? So with third degree AV node blocks, you have tons and tons of skipped beats. But at least about 20 beats to 40 beats per minute, you can still hit your ventricle. Why is that? Sorry, I'm not, I'm not making you answer. I'm actually going to show you guys. It's good, it's good to see, like, how is this possible? The cool thing is remember how we ran through these rhythm dictators, SA nodes 1, bundles hiss, and then Purkinje fibers. The SA node is your best pacemaker. But it's not the only one possible. Your heart has fail safe. Your biggest fail safe is the Purkinje fibers. They have some funny sodium channels. And if the signals from the SA node are damaged or not coming in, this is your emergency source of pacing in the heart. But it's not as fast. It's not as good. So it's a fail safe. And it can get you about 20 beats, 30 beats per minute, but it's slow. And this is where you do need to step in and treat somebody quickly and make sure whatever's blocking this transition right here gets solved. And that's where you do get into heart surgery or some more aggressive drug therapy. So, kind of a cool little feature for Kinji bundle of his can do the same thing. They can take over with four of the SA nodes for the rhythm for periods of time. I wouldn't say, I would not say permanently though. Because again, even though you are going to be able to get a lot of your beats to go through, and by a lot, I mean, you know, 30 per minute, which is great. All that other time, you got a ton of stiff beats, a ton of damage, a ton of blood pooling, which isn't good. Okay. So it is kind of cool that your heart does have a backup plan. That is pretty neat. I mean, because it really sucks if you have an AV node blockage and you just have a heart attack. So, last one. Yeah, we'll cover that one last, actually. Yeah, we'll cover heart attack last and what, and what infarction do. All right, so let's focus again on the atria. And remember, atrias are important. But as we look at these diseases, we're going to go up and up and up, worse and worse and worse. So, issues in the atria rarely are life threatening. So, if you have a small premature contraction right here of the atria, noted here with an extra T wave, you actually still get a QRS as long as it's just one of them. So, yeah, an extra beat thrown in there from an ectopic source, like we talked about, all those weird stuff that can happen and stimulate the heart, as long as it's just one, you're going to be fine. You've got an extra beat coming in here. Things kind of take a, maybe a little longer to reset, but ultimately you're okay. Pretty low stakes here. That's if there's one. What happens if we have multiple beats in succession and they keep going? If you watch Grey's Anatomy, this is what they call TAC, tachycardia. Sustained beat, 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 beat. And it's not coming from the SA mode, it's coming from something else. That something else would be a few things. As far as the disease physiology is concerned, something has taken over producing T waves. But the good thing you can see on this, though, is that every QRS is followed, or every T wave is followed by a QRS. You are causing your heart to beat way too quickly, but you're surviving. Blood is flowing, you're doing okay. This is something that you have to treat, but ultimately, a lot of people do live with this chronically, you know. Anybody that knows people with higher blood pressure, you know, higher heartbeat stuff. I had one of my students had a resting heart rate of 90. I would, that, was a, that was a lot. Um, I did advise her to maybe go get checked. She's fine. She's fine. Don't worry. Um, sorry. But it was, I was like, oh, okay. Like, that's, that was a lot. That was pretty impressive. But we're good. Let's take a look here, though, at, um, yeah, here, I wanted to, wanted to show an example from this. Okay. Target here. 
Oh, yeah. Do you remember in the Turtle Heart when we did, we were doing the frequent simulations, we basically took over as the pacemaker for a little while there, and it was responding each time we hit it, and we were hitting it like once every second. That's what the, that's what atrial tachycardia is. Whenever you see tachycardia, it's always, it's okay. You know, technically the heart is still beating, we're still doing well. Um, one way that an ectopic source can interfere, I know we keep coming back to this one, one way that a sustained ectopic source can happen is that there's some sort of damage with the Purkinje fiber pathway. Remember how this returns a small axis potential back up to the AV node kind of stuff? If for some reason, let's say, and I know this is a really busy image here, sorry. Let's say there's some damage in this ventricle right here. Oops. This signal, instead of going through the ventricle, may accidentally go up, may recycle back into the atria each time that it's being pulled to excite the ventricle. So if you have parts of your heart that get damaged or messed up, or let's say they have a clot and they break and you know they aren't are denied oxygen, like a gas junction to ruin, the signal isn't smart. It'll go wherever it can go and it may be able to go back into the atria. So it's the same basically recycling of action potentials can be a source of consistent ectopic signals in that case. And the key to these arrhythmias is that they have to be faster than the SA node. Tachycardia in Latin is faster than normal, basically. That's what that's, that's, what that's saying. So even if you had an ectopic source that it was slower for whatever reason, it's not going to actually show up as much. We're not, that's why it's kind of hard to diagnose that. All right, so moving up in severity, atrial flutter. Now you are going so quickly with your rhythm that your QRSs cannot accomplish a beat in time. So for every two or three P waves that you're getting, you only get one QRS. Ventricles cannot keep up in this case. Too fast. So, while flutter is not lethal, because you are getting blood pumping through, again, you're pushing your ventricles to a point that they shouldn't be going. You're letting lots of blood actually fill in these big delayed periods right here. Your atria are also just going nuts right now. They're pumping blood in each of those T waves. They're basically drying up while your ventricles are filling up. And again, like you said, too much filling, too, many, too much blood, too many clots, all kinds of damage can start showing up. So again, not lethal and technically can be a chronic condition, but you have to be very carefully monitored because if we increase the speed one more time, whatever this source is, you get into AFib, as it's called, atrial fibrillation. What you have here now is that everything is so quick in these P waves, quote unquote, that you can't even see them anymore. It's basically just a sustained amount of stimulus over and over and over again. And the sad thing is here is that these are not QRS waves. These are just the person G fiber fail phase waves. They're just ours. That's it. Atrial fibrillation means that your atria are completely blown at this point. They are not coordinating the heart whatsoever. And everything is now relying on your fail safe back of system. You do need to treat this. This is very different as we'll see than what we're going to get into in the ventricle. The atria is not necessary to get the blood to your brain. The ventricles are. Your ventricles are still technically working here. But this does need treatment. And pretty quickly because this can lead to some other bad stuff. Okay, now we're gonna get in, last step. Now we're gonna get into the big stuff, and this is where hospital visits start being 
you know, in two minutes to live type stuff, this is where we're at. The ventricles do the work. If you mess up the ventricles, you mess up the brain. Lose the brain, lose the body. So starting small though in the ventricle, here's a nice normal PQRS, T, PQRS, T. If you accidentally get an ectopic like stimulus right in the ventricle for some reason, you end up with this little inverted QRS. And in this case, it's just an R in this case. The T wave's kind of messed up, but your heart is able to reach that after a pause. So if you have something messing with your ventricle, that's not great because they're going to overfill a little bit, they're going to stretch a little bit. But ultimately, after a few beats, you can go back to normal. Still not great, though. And remember, we're dealing with the ventricle at this point. This is, this is probably, if you see this on a patient's ECG, it's, per, it's fairly serious, because it's going to lead down the line to what we're going to have next. And especially, this is also true, so when you see this like here, this is all a skipped beat, quote unquote, too. When you have skipped beats, like I said, same consequences. Ventricles have too much, etc. All right, so that was one stimulus. Let's look at some repeated stimulus in the ventricle. All right, V tac, ventricle tachycardia. Something other than the SA node has taken over. For whatever reason, and like I said, ectopic sources are diverse. Your ventricles are no longer under control of the pacemaking of the SA node. They are firing on their own each time. They are firing in rhythm. So it's kind of a pathetic, not very well organized rhythm, and it's out of sync completely with the atria. But depending on what the atria are giving in this pace, because they're not coordinated to this at all, you may be pumping. 80% of your ventricle, maybe pumping 20% resistance, 50%, 40%, 50, 40%. Complete unregulation. We can break this down to the one, two, three of what happens here, too. So, rapid rate, that is going to lead to filling time is reduced. Okay? A reduced filling time leads to a smaller volume. Smaller volume means a lower cardiac output. Remember, cardiac output equals heart rate times volume filled. Less time to fill, less volume filled, less cardiac output. I think you guys have seen mean arterial pressure math in lecture, right? Yep. When your blood pressure starts going so low, this is when you start passing out, for example. Your blood is not getting to your brain. It's not pumping enough. And that's the consequence of this. Pass out, brain damage. But we are still in the range with this of somewhere in the neighborhood of about 30, 45 minutes that this can sustain. So it's kind of a progressive thing. The longer you have the sex cardio happening, the less filling you're getting, less brain that's altered, less pressure in the blood that's actually reaching your head. Some is still. That's why you have some time to get to an ambulance in this case. Get to a hospital, get treated, you can control that. So tachycardia, we're still fast enough to beat. But this is kind of the final, this is kind of the boss level right here. Ventricular fib. This is where there's so much stimulus to the ventricle coming from all which directions in the heart, all over the place. The gap junctions are filling with all kinds of action potentials. They're everywhere. The ventricles are basically just vibrating and they can't do anything. They're not pumping any blood at this point. This means you have two to three minutes for this person. This is why we have so many defibrillators around 
right now, especially at that, at that uh, sorry, especially at gyms or athletic events, because even younger people may have, you know, small conditions in their ventricles that can stay hidden, and then all of a sudden, if it causes a bunch of stimuli to show up or get recycled first in the ventricles, you can get into this destructive arrhythmia that you cannot get out of. So the defibrillators, these are the paddles. What the paddles actually do, let's take a look at defib. Okay, so what the paddles are doing, so here's your fib, here's the shock. What the shock actually does is flatline you. It stops the heart from moving. It actually, quote unquote, not, you can't use it, it kills the heart, right? It doesn't, but it doesn't permanently, it just shocks it. Kills a bad word in that case. Not, it's not helpful. Okay, what happens is you hope for a flat line right here. You want to get rid of this awful rhythm and whatever's happening. You basically burst out all the action potentials and you hope that the heart and the SA node come back to life. Let me try again. This is what you want, but too often, this is what you get. The arrhythmia is still there, it comes back, the relation continues. And the percentage of each shot goes down each time. It's about six shots that you're not looking at chopping them a seven time. That's not, it's not practical at this point. So one of my students in section 12 actually is an EMT, and he actually showed the classroom in Turtle Heart Lab a patient fibrillating. But they didn't make it, unfortunately. They had the flat line, but the fibrillation continued. So, how can something so damaging occur like this? How can you deregulate this and extend action potentials in every direction, all at once? A big, giant mess. And that is the characteristic heart disease that most of us already kind of know about a heart attack. So this is the final disease, we're all set after this. <clears throat> what a heart attack is, essentially, and it can happen without people knowing it and the damage can be done. All of myocardial infarction is, is that a portion of the ventricle, and yeah, right here, is deprived of blood flow for some reason, and those cells in that part of the heart die. When those cells die, no more gas functions, no more action potential. The signal has to go around them. If the signal goes around them in a bad way, it may start feeding the ventricles on its own, recycling, anything like that. The sign of a patient who has had a heart attack or is in the process of having a heart attack is right here. The QRS finishes into the T wave. QRS does not finish part of the T wave. So instead of finishing down here, you end up here instead. And that's a characteristic sign. Somebody has some sort of damage there. Now this could be from all kinds of reasons. Embolus, clots, continued stress, some sort of physical damage to the heart, anything like that. The sad thing is that we like, I think in the, you know, kind of in the 90s, we tried to treat this like before it happened with stuff like Lipitor, drugs that would go in and like, quote unquote, like make your heart okay all the time. Turns out they just went and fried all your motor neurons in your brain and gave people Parkinson's, unfortunately. Don't sue me Lipitor, but whatever. That's in, that's in the papers. So preventing this kind of damage isn't something that you can change just strictly with a drug. It's not yet a lifestyle thing where you don't want to stress your heart out. You want to be doing exercise as much as you can to keep it efficient. That's the way that you present, usually can prevent damage like that. But this damage is what leads to this, ultimately. Severe heart attack is so bad in the moment that the fibrillation occurs right then that the damage is so bad. Smaller heart attacks can happen. Like a lot of us probably know people that have had heart attacks. It's happening. You make the ambulance, get treated, it's okay. The damage is still there and they have to be monitored forever. But they did make it before this happened. That's good. Okay. 
lots of doom and gloom. The heart's actually a pretty good thing. Like we're we're pretty we're pretty good at treating it, but we do have to be very very good at recognizing when things are not going well, basically, because that's the key in treating these conditions, or at least jumping in before they uh, before they really get bad, right? All right, so I don't have any. Um, hooray! I don't have any uh, practice questions for this section, so let's just do this Kahoot. Uh, the last section liked it; they thought they thought it was pretty good. Um, so in this case, these are good practice questions, I think, that reflect like how I'm kind of coming uh, for those four questions that'll be on the ECG section of the exam. Um, I couldn't include these on the, the guide that I put up, so I just wanted to give you guys the option. So, hooray! I wonder how many. Some people love Kahoot, other people hate them. I'm sorry if you hate Kahoot. Hooray. Oh yeah, and it's the random nickname generator so even I can play. Wow, this is way better than calling on the groups out of the, out a little pot again, right? Penny, Penny did that to her on Monday. She even called me on one of those conditions like, you know, like, what happened here? And I was like, uh. I just tossed out like an educated guess, and thank goodness it was right. It was a hard, hard question too. It was like a complex one. Yeah, yeah, it'll, it'll just make it a random name. Yeah, that keeps it anonymous. You can take credit when you win if you want. Yeah. Some of these are pretty good. Silly Leopard, that's a good one. I did find out if you click the name, it kicks that person out. I feel like kicked out one of the leaders last time. It was super bad. All right, Mighty Wolf, that's pretty good. Some of these aren't bad. Hero Owl, that's funny. Hero Owl and Silly Leopard, this is the beginning of a, this is the beginning of like a, a novel or something. Eh, maybe not. Polite Piranha, that's, that's bad. All right, let's do this. You guys know the drill, speed is king, and it will be on your test too. All right, what is the resulting abnormal wave after myocardial infarct damage of the ventricle? Yeah, you just covered that. So that image is always going to be up there as a reference for you. It's not always going to be related. This was definitely the hardest one in the last class, too. Yeah, that was a hard one. Okay. So in this case, yeah, heart attack usually because they're coming in the ventricle. They're not going to associate with those multiple C waves. It's that the QRS never gets to end basically because the damage is like still, you have to go around the damage essentially. Ooh, dynamic glider. Very quick. Very good. All right. Normal sequence. All right. How does it go? I normally don't rely on sequence questions in an exam because I think they can be confusing, but this is ungraded good feedback, so it's good. The image is actually pretty helpful here, too. Nice. Yeah, see, there's just one skip right here. The SA node is the original source, follows through the atria, then the ventricles. Oh, dynamic glider still doing well. Hero owl on the rise. All right. Which represents ventricular depolarization. Which is the one depolarized means stimulate and hit, which is the one that is associated with the big ventricle. Dang, the image just gives this one. Dang it. No, one second. Nothing. All right. So yeah, this is QRS. This is something I actually should probably cover on the on the projector. But yeah, so that QRS wave, that's the burst of depolarization into the ventricle. Depolarization of the atria is the P wave, and the T wave is actually the repolarization of the ventricle. That's the Purkinje fiber reset at the end. 
for snail on fire. I don't know how they designate fire. I think everybody, yeah. Okay. Which of the following represents the worst possible condition we just covered? Which is the worst thing possible? We covered it. We got two to three minutes with this one. Think about which one is the most important. Oh, I think we're at 19 actually now. I think we lost 20. Nice. Okay, yeah. So it's ventricular fib. Anytime you look for importance as far as severity, anything in the ventricles always works. Atria says, as long as your ventricles are kind of working, they're going to pump blood to your head. But yeah, if you lose the fibrillation there, you're in big trouble. Yeah, so yesterday I like clicked on somebody's name as like be like, oh, this is a funny name, and it X'd them out, and they were one of the leaders. <laughs> and I was like, I'm so sorry, so and so. All right, last one. What is the natural fastest pacemaker of the heart? What's the thing that sets the pace every time? What's the thing that should be setting the pace? Not the backup plan. Was the rhythm maker? Oh, that was. Wait a second, that was super quick. Oh, nice. Okay, gap junction propagates the signal, but they don't originate it. Yeah. SA note, very good. It's gonna come down to quickness. You can claim whoever whoever won, you can claim it if you want, but if not, if you want to be anonymous, it's okay. Three to ferret. Very good. Fuzzy macaw. I would not want to see that, whatever that would be. Oh. Dynamic glider winner. Not going really off at 200 points. Quick. I always lose these because I was so slow, so dang it. Does anybody want to claim their their like praise? I don't know. Yeah, that's okay. Oh good! Hooray! Oh good, yay! All right, congrats to the class! Hooray! Shoot! <laughs> All right. Good job, everybody. Yeah, you cannot minimize Zoom. Oh, I can't. Okay. Let's get out of this goofy music. There we go. Please. Cool. Okay. So um, now we're gonna break out, do the actual ECGs. What that's gonna take is you're gonna set up your own Eindhoven's triangle on one of you know one of the lab members of yourself. The Zoom person can kind of follow along, help as they go, kind of read the directions, make sure you're checking everything, and then you're gonna have somebody running the computer. Um, this uh, breakout room setup is gonna take a bit because I have to rework who's in what group at this point because of our numbers. So give me maybe an extended five to six minutes um, as we work through this. And uh, if you're in class, I'll tell you kind of who to move to and what to do and such like that. So, all right, give me some, give me a sec here.